Um, we have a great program here for you this afternoon. Thanks also to everyone who is watching online via the webcast. Uh, before we get started, I want to give a thank you to uh, Catherine Streifel and Emily Fakey on my team for their great work helping to pull this event together. Also a thank you to uh, Travis Hopkins for his assistance uh, today. We are delighted to have Dr. Chris Murray here to discuss the Institute for Health and Metrics and Evaluation's new Finance and Global Health 2014 report. I'm sure that Dr. Murray needs no introduction, but very briefly, he is a professor of global health at the University of Washington and director of IHME. He is one of the founders of the Global Burden of Disease Approach, and his work has helped transform how governments and decision makers measure and evaluate public health interventions. Dr. Murray will kick things off by presenting the new report in his online tool. I will then ask Dr. Howard Bachner, Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of the American Medical Association, and Dr. Jen Cates, Vice President and Director of Global Health and HIV Policy at the Kaiser Family Foundation, to join Chris and me on stage for a panel discussion. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Murray to the stage. Good afternoon. And uh, let me start first by recognizing that uh, I'm here along with uh, Joe Dealman in the front here is the lead author on, on the study. And uh, we're very appreciative uh, for this opportunity to talk about the findings. We're also very appreciative to JAMA and Howard uh, Bachner, who's here for publishing uh, the main findings. And then in addition, there's the more detailed supplementary tables and graphs that go along in the report. Uh, but the main messages are there in the piece that was published last week uh, in JAMA. And I'm going to show you some of the key findings in this research using the online data visualization that's available uh, there now. And I think uh, some of the visuals you'll recognize from the JAMA paper and from the report are similar and probably easier to follow in the online uh, version. Before going through the sort of main empirical findings, just a, a what is this type uh, reflection on the work on tracking spend. So at the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, uh, we do many things. One of them is the global burden of disease, which is our attempt to systematize the world's evidence on what's happening to human health by population over time by country. And then in parallel, we have this body of work trying to track where resources go. And the focus here is on tracking what we call development assistance for health. And those are resources that originate essentially in northern countries that go towards uh, health or with the primary intent of improving health in low and middle income uh, countries. And our definition of development assistance for health includes uh, monies that come from the World Bank, uh, regional development banks, from private philanthropy and from private donations, which is a broader construct than, for example, overseas development assistance. So that's what we call DAH, Development Assistance for Health. And what we try to do is tr uh, take all the financial statements of various organizations and work through uh, the challenges of double counting and figure out what the totals are and where do they start? And for the very first time, we've been able this year to connect both the source of the funds, the institutional channel by which they flow, and also uh, the health focus area, as well as the country and region uh, where the funds go. So we've in the past been able to track pieces of that story. And now I think what's really interesting is we've actually been able to weave it all together uh, to give you that view from source to channel to final uh, health focus area. And I'm sure in, in the Q&A part, we can explore what this means. And I'm just going to sort of give you a tour of the main findings from this effort at pulling together the information on the, the dollar flows. I'm not going to talk about one, the other part of financial flows, which is what governments themselves spend on health, which is a larger sum of money uh, globally than what comes from development assistance. And just as a reminder that uh, even in sub-Saharan Africa, where development assistance is large and many countries are low income, it, on average, development assistance is still only 40%. So 60% on average is coming from the governments themselves. So bear that in mind as we think and reflect on the development assistance for health component. So here's a signature uh, 
graph that shows in constant dollars, updated to 2014 US dollars, from 1990 through to 2014, what is the total development assistance for health? And you can see the sort of three phases, and it's broken down by country of origin. So the bar for the United States is not just the US government, that's all sources based in the US. The bar, um, I mean, this is actually channel, sorry. So that is US bilateral. Uh, when I show you source, it'll be all sources for the US. So on this diagram, you can see that we started off at about uh, $6.5 billion in 1990, and we're up to around about $35, $36 billion in the most recent four or five years. And there's clearly three phases uh, of um, the, the growth of spend. And there's a slow growth period from 1990 to about 2000, a rapid growth of about 11% per year to around 2010 or 11, and then a period of sort of flat line with some variation year to year from 2010 onwards. And on the right-hand side, you can see absolute change in spend by different channel. The big growth, for example, and this is from 2000 to 2010 during the period of rapid increase. The big growth of the Global Fund, the growth of NGOs, the growth of the Gates Foundation in absolute terms, and then the huge growth of US expenditure. If we change that to percents, you can see Gavi that was essentially zero uh, in percent terms looks very large. Uh, if we go back to absolutes, you can see the absolute change. Now, if I change this period of growth from 2010 to, from 2010 to 14, the sort of flatline period, you see a somewhat different story about growth in the, in the period. U.S. flat from that period, uh, U.K. continuing to grow, continued expansion of uh, money flowing through the U.N., through Gavi, through the Global Fund, and through direct uh, programs of the Gates Foundation. Now, if we back up to source, you get a different picture. The U.S. is quite dominant in terms of a source, with the U.K. coming next, and then uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is the third largest source of development assistance uh, at the global scale. And you can see some of the evolution uh, by source over time. Uh, and I'll show you that in a different way in a moment. And then finally, if we look at health focus area, you, there's some important findings, I think, in the more recent time period, which is that development assistance for HIV has been pretty flatline. There has been continued growth, 2010 to 14. You can see it over here for child and newborn health. From maternal health, in the last year, the injection of money into Ebola is, you can see it at the global level. And you've seen declines in some areas, uh, some of the other categories, as well uh, as other infectious diseases. So flatline HIV, continued shift towards more spending on newborn, child, and maternal health. Now, what we've done, as I mentioned, I think which is new here, and the major sort of uh, contribution of this work uh, in the recent time period has been to connect all up those different static views of, uh, uh, or slices of the world, which is from source to channel to focus area. So uh, this is a nice sort of signature diagram for just reminding us just how complicated global health is, uh, because you have over here on the left the actual orig originating source of dollars, private philanthropy, we pull out the Gates Foundation because it's so important, other governments, and then the big governments contributing, Australia, UK, France, US, Canada, and Germany. And this is for 2014. I am going to go back now and do a little bit of history and give you these flows at the macro level in 1990. And not only was the total smaller, six and a bit billion, but the makeup of the flows looks rather different. Um, and, for example, France was an important donor back in 1990, as proportions go. Uh, and the UK, in terms of contributions to health, was much smaller. Go to the beginning of the, of the sort of golden era for golden health in terms of dollar uh, growth. You have a picture where the development banks were now quite a bit more important than they were before quite a bit more pluralism in terms of sources. Uh, the rise of new mechanisms like the Gates Foundation. And if we go forward again to 2010 at the sort of peak of growth, uh, 
or the end of the peak of growth, you can see what's happened is the U.S. has become a major source. Its funds throwing through bilateral channels, but also through various multilateral mechanisms, for example, through foundations, the global fund and this flow, money's going to the U.N. in that flow. And finally, if we come on to 2014, what you'll see is the sort of state that I was showing, where the U.S. is a dominant funder, but followed by uh, the U.K. and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. For channels, you have the rise of the Global Fund and the rise of Gavi down here. Now, in this tool, we can start to drill in on this. So if we take, for example, the Global Fund and say, well, let's just focus on that. There's the sources for the Global Fund, uh, which contributors in terms of their resources in each year in, in 2014 of disbursement, back calculated, and then what it goes to for HIV, malaria, TB, and then for uh, some health system investments. <clears throat> if we go back now, we can do the same sort of analysis around Gavi, and you can see the sort of diversity of funding for Gavi, the UK, the Gates Foundation, a, a mixture of other governments and then the U.S. So uh, the, the rise of these new uh, mechanisms that are quite uh, quantitatively large in terms of dollars and their diverse funding. Now another way to look at the results here is to ask what do countries spend on? So if we go through the top three donors. Here's the U.S., you know, a very dominant component from the U.S. overall as a source is U.S. government in pink. And then, uh, I mean, U.S. flows to uh, USAID in pink, and then to funds to the Global Fund, channeled through NGOs, UN agencies. And here by focus area, you can see the enormous contribution to HIV from the U.S., maternal health, malaria. It's a dominant funder for child health, uh, as an example. Contrast that to the U.K., and you see much less for HIV. Uh, a much larger fraction going to child health and to maternal health, and a larger fraction going to health systems and swap type investments. But like the U.S., not quite as impressive, uh, a substantial flow through bilateral channels. And then the last of the sources that I want to highlight in this sort of review of, of main findings is the Gates Foundation, which has become number three uh, in terms of this list of key sources. And the direct pro giving of uh, the Gates Foundation is a big component, but not all. They give through the Global Fund, through NGOs, Gavi, and monies to the UN. As many of you may now know, uh, for example, the, the Gates Foundation is the number two funder of WHO, and that gets reflected as you see here. All right, so that's a view from the source end. One of the observations, I think, by linking these up is that there are some health focus areas with dominant funders, and then there are some health focus areas where you can see, with all the colored lines here, have a much broader base of source uh, of funding. So first, HIV, if we look at it from that perspective, you can see where the monies are going to HIV programs PEPFAR uh, and, and the U.S. programs, uh, the, the most important, Global Fund, and then a variety of other mechanisms, but a huge important role in this for the U.S. If we do that same analysis for malaria, bigger role for the Global Fund, but the U.S. and the Global Fund together account for most of malaria, so uh, an another example of if there's major changes in those sources, then that's likely to have a pretty dominant effect in the future on flows uh, for malaria. And then if you look at the, the two areas where there's been the most growth in the last four years in the period of flatline, child health, you can see just how much more diverse funding streams are for child health, but a very prominent role, as you'd expect, for Gavi. Uh, but nowhere near that sort of prominence that Global Fund has for malaria or U.S. PEPFAR has for HIV. Same type of analysis on maternal, and that's probably the last of these I'll show, where you can, uh, and you know, you can all play with this tool online yourselves, um, if you want to sort of, you know, explore or the findings. But 
here, like child health, support for uh, maternal health comes from quite a diverse set of organizations. And because they're not in the Gavi or Global Fund uh, framework, there's no dominant source from one of the big public-private partnerships uh, to date on maternal health. Now, uh, I know there's some people out in the uh, hall. Should we try to let them in somehow? Or <coughs> Okay, I uh, just noticed them sort of milling out there. Uh, and let me just close this sort of framing of the discussion with uh, just the geographic pattern that's there, and I won't go into great detail, but of course there is a geographic pattern. This is showing development assistance in 2012 because there's a bit more of a lag of being able to trace it to, to the geographic areas uh, than there is for some of the other components that we track. But this is showing uh, development assistance per DALI, no, sorry, per population, let's switch to DALIs, uh, in 2012. And just to show the places, and you can just sort of get rid of some of the smaller areas, the places that have uh, sort of more than $20 per DALI, you get, uh, you can see the prominent role in, in that respect. Uh, if you think of DALIs as a metric of need uh, for uh, the PEPFAR corridor, as well as a number of select other countries where one prominent donor, for example, the Inter-American Development Bank and the World Bank of Investments in Argentina, which is the reason it lights up like that. And you can find similar stories for some of the other countries, like Mongolia. So that's a flavor of the findings and what insights that have come now from being able to link all the way through from source to health focus area. And also, there's been a lot of work that's gone on in trying to tease out a much more rich set of health focus areas than has been possible in the past. Uh, you know, I'm sure it's going to come up in Q&A because of the division there between newborn and child health and maternal health. And because uh, if you think about it compared to DALI's, one of the things that's in the JAMA paper that we highlight is that maternal health, in terms of spend per DALI, is about, about the same level as HIV and then everything else is dramatically lower per DALI. So there's maternal and HIV. Uh, but the maternal numbers, I think we have to interpret, taking into account that maternal interventions may also affect newborn, uh, you know, more early neonatal mortality. And that's not reflected in that DALI denominator in these analyses. So you might make an argument that if you take that into account, eventually the spend per maternal and early neonatal DALI is lower than in the case of HIV. So just that uh, further reflection to what's in, in the paper and in the report. So I'll stop there, and uh, hopefully that was a good sort of intro to some of the material that's in the, in, in the paper and, and in the longer version in the report. So thank you very much. <laughs> or fall down. Um, well, while we're waiting for that to happen, um, Howard, why don't we turn to you um, to start with a few minutes of comments. Um, you know, JAMA receives thousands of submissions every year uh, for publication. What made you choose this article? Yeah. So uh, JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, gets about 5,000 papers uh, each year. Uh, we send out for review about 1,600, and then ultimately we accept about 240. And um, the, the process is rigorous. I know Joe's in the audience. He knows how rigorous it is because I tortured him for three months over every single word in the paper. Um, but um, the peer reviewers 
uh, thought that this had been the single best analysis that they had ever read uh, about the flow of dollars over a 15-year period in global health. So we go from five or six billion dollars a year that moves from rich countries to poorer countries to about 30 or 35 billion. Uh, where does it originate? What does it flow through and where does it go? And the peer reviewers felt that this was the best analysis they had ever seen. Um, why, why was that important to JAMA? Well, one, it's unique and it's innovative, the analysis. So we're always interested in papers that tell a story that people haven't really seen or heard before. Um, the, the second, are, are the data true? So are the results valid? Um, and uh, I, I think if you read the whole report, particularly the supplement, you'll see the care that IHME took to make sure that their analysis of the data were accurate. Um, they could be off a little bit, and they acknowledge that in the limitations, but generally they've given an incredibly wonderful picture of this flow uh, of dollars. And I think the, the last reason it was uh, of great interest to Hasajama is if you think of the eras of global health, uh, globalism, which is in the newspaper every day, it's on every medical school campus, every academic medical center is now interested in globalism. There's a great, greater shift of dollars than ever before. I think we've come to the end of the first chapter, which was the investment. So that begins in the late 1980s, uh, and it seems to have peaked. It may increase again if the economy gets better, but you've seen a great increase in investment. It may grow a bit more depending upon what happens with the Gates Foundation and the Buffett dollars and how much of that eventually goes, goes to global health. But now there's the next question to be asked. Are we spending $35 billion well? Which is a incredibly important question. So what Chris didn't show you is the other data that he also generates, which is under five mortality in the world has come down uh, substantially over the last decade. The crisis in HIV AIDS is very different now than it, it once was. Is that a result of the way the dollars have been spent? In order to move to the second generation of global health, we need to understand the flow of resources. And I think this is a landmark paper because it will start the discussion about how we move from just giving away dollars to understanding whether or not we're giving away those dollars in a, in a way that provides uh, value both for patients and for countries. The last comment I would make is we know that the future is non-communicable diseases and infrastructure. And what was tremendously disappointing in the data was this very small investment, both in infrastructure and non-communicable diseases. Now the struggle is when you face a global epidemic that's affecting an entire continent like Ebola, how do you acquire new dollars to invest to stop that epidemic? We are much more effective at uh, the approach to emergencies with respect to infectious diseases than we are in building infrastructure. And so I think the next part of global health will be to understand how to use those dollars to build an infrastructure that can also respond to epidemics. Okay, thank you. Jen, I'll turn to you for a few comments. And then we'll... Thanks, and thanks Talia and CSIS for um, inviting me to be part of this. And, and to Chris and IHME and his team and Joe, um, this is you know, the most comprehensive research on financing in the world. We all use it, we all look to it, and it tells the most complete pic picture for us to understand um, implications for policy, for practice. Um, so thank you again for, for, for doing this. Um, so I was you know, trying to take a step back and say, what does this all mean for policy um, and the implications for the future? And there are four points I want to make. The first has to do with the MDG agenda and success of it, quote unquote. The second about the flattening of the resources. The third about the US role. And the fourth about the risk of backsliding. So on the first, um, I think it's pretty clear from the data that there, the MDG agenda has been a success. And I'm, I'm putting that in quotation marks and I'll come back to that. But if you look at the data, um, whether it's literally the goals themselves or just the, the galvanizing around those, those goals, um, the response, the leadership, uh, political will, finances, and frankly, um, I think a confluence of factors historically that we probably will never see again 
or may never see again. It's sort of an unprecedented um, story that we can now, we see in the data. Um, and that's very significant. Um, and then, which leads me to the second point about the flattening. There is a flattening in the, in the funding. The resources have flattened. Um, and, and really, this is across the board and where you look. And so should we be concerned? And I think the question is, we should. Um, it is, one of the fundamental outstanding issues is how is that $35 billion being spent? But the other question is the agenda is unfinished, the MDG agenda. Um, we haven't finished it. Um, WHO just came out with a report saying that there are 400 million people that lack at least one essential health service. And if you look at how they define essential health services, it's all MDG agenda related services. So we clearly, and, and you can look at many measures of that, we clearly have not finished that agenda, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. So the flattening raises that concern. Coupled with, um, now we're in the post-2015 agenda and the sustainable, sustainable development goals. And if you look at that um, a proposed set of 17 goals and more than you know, 100, 160 targets, uh, it's a much more expansive agenda. It's a much more comprehensive agenda. And so that has pros and cons. Health is one piece of a much bigger agenda, a much more crowded space today that um, is going to compete for policymakers' attention, for resources, um, and frankly, for you know, finishing the job. And I think that just, it, it, the appetite may not be there. Um, we see it not just in the financing, but the appetite may not be there in terms of political will to finish the agenda and take on all the new challenges or challenges that have been under-recognized that we've, we've had in the past. The third point is the role of the US. And as we saw from these data, the US is about a third of all global DH, D, uh, development assistance for health. And if you look just at donors, the US is more than half. So it has an out, outsized role. If the US goes up, that makes a difference. If the US goes down, if the US remains flat. And you can actually, we can answer some of what's happening with the US because we know what happened in 2015 and we know what's likely to happen in 2016, which is essentially flat. And if you look at specific areas within that, some will do a little better, some might not do as well, but the US is not going to increase. Um, and I think that's an important uh, piece to remember. And I think the, the point that Chris made about domestic government resources is a critical one but they're not necessarily going to be able to pick up any gap that remains in, in the near term. And the last point on the risk of backsliding, um, this, there is a risk, I think. If we, if we agree that there's an unfinished agenda, maybe some don't agree with that, um, especially for infectious diseases, there is a risk to um, not finishing that. And we, we, we can see what could happen with Ebola. Um, we can see what happens with HIV in the United States in places where there might have been less awareness that HIV could, could um, uh, be an issue. And so I just think it's, it should give us all pause. It should give policymakers pause, but we know that the fiscal environment and the crowded sort of attention, uh, field of attention for policymakers on not just global health but development for all very important causes and issues is gonna pose a challenge for that going forward. So maybe that's a little bit of a doom and gloom, but I don't mean it to be. I think it's a realistic sense of where we are um, and some concerns about, about the future. So. Great, thank you. Well, you, um, you are the great launching point for what I wanted to start in on, which was you know, last year, Kristen, you were here, we were talking about a 4% growth in funding. We were talking about donor resolve. We were feeling mm -hmm. relatively optimistic. Um, this year, we're seeing a slight decline, a 1.6% decline, but that's in light of you know, an Ebola crisis that galvanized the world attention around global health. It's in light of a very successful Gavi replenishment. Um, we just saw this week, I think Finland announced it's gonna be cutting its foreign aid budget by 40%. Um, is the, you know, where do we see this going? I mean, what are your thoughts looking at the data? Is this trend as troubling as it could be interpreted to be? Uh, I, th I think the, if you looked at those percent changes by source, it's sort of by chance that it's flatlined, right? Because you've had some declines, you've had the U.S. stagnating, and then you've had, you know, uh, increases through Gavi, somewhat through, through the Gates Foundation. Um, so there's, there's no particular reason why things couldn't converge that they actually go down uh, or uh, and you don't hear a lot of discussion right now about people likely to increase spend, at least I haven't. Um, you know, there's some places that that might happen, but I, it seems likely it will be either flat or there is this risk of, of actual declines in a, in a world where the SDG position of health is even a little bit worse than I think you're describing. It's, it's A, crowded, 
And then you have signature things like you know, the progress on child mortality, and, and although there's a target about ending preventable child death, there's no indicator. We, we somehow lost child mortality, at least in the negotiations so far. And I think it's been that it's less the goals and more the indicators and the sort of drive, at least in my interpretation, around MDGs and all that constant attention about progress. So I think the indicators matter, and you have so many now uh, on this health list that it may be hard to sort of maintain the focus. My, one of the concerns I have is I, I don't know if science is going to be the great contributor in the future as it was in the last 15 years. The NIH budget is about 30 or 31 billion dollars. It's unchanged essentially in five years. Against inflation, it's decreased. But some of the great gains that you've seen in global health is because of the investment in science, both in the United States and around the world. So when you have a pneumococcal vaccine or an H flu vaccine that elim literally eliminates millions of deaths around the world, that's an extraordinary gain. I'm not quite sure we're going to see those gains coming out of the basic science uh, engine, both in the United States and around the world, as we've seen in the past. There's some novel developments, broadly neutralizing antibodies could give you vaccines that are more widely adaptable. But uh, I don't think I'm telling anyone here, we've struggled with malaria vaccination, HIV vaccination. There could be some gains from signs, but they may not be as great as they were in the last decade. So as we move into the SDG uh, uh, phase, one of, the, one of the key pieces when we're talking about the rise of non-communicable diseases and we're talking about a push towards universal health coverage, um, which is a major theme across a lot of the developing world, particularly as countries are moving into middle income status. Um, it's a very different, supporting UHC is very different than the siloed approach that we've seen across individual diseases. Um, and I think it makes contributing to health and kind of how, your, how those flows of money are going might need to adjust. I mean, the channels that you just described for us, to what extent to achieve universal health coverage and support that piece of the SDGs, are donors going to really need to rethink the channels that they use to direct their, their funding? And are there ways in which uh, they can impact health system strengthening and some of the necessary infrastructure investments that we know we're going to need? Uh, <clears throat> good question. Uh, you know, I think both the uh, new, you know, the no, new financing facility that's uh, going to be housed at the bank. I think the health system windows through Gavi and uh, other organizations provide some mechanism. Uh, whether anybody has an appetite for another channel for that, I'm not convinced, other than the ones that, that are, are there. And on, so that's on one reflection. The, the other reflection about the universal health coverage, the thing that's interesting about that, at least in uh, middle income countries, is that you can broaden the audience domestically of who's interested in financing beyond those whose primary interest is in health because the financial risk protection element, the protection from catastrophic spend, if you look at a place like Mexico, you know, the, they were pretty effective at getting the Ministry of Finance interested in that as an outcome. And that can, in some places, has worked to raise uh, domestic spend. And I think that's one of the, the hopes there on the, on the universal health, uh, the universal coverage agenda. Uh, Low-income countries is a very different story where, you know, external finance is going to be part of that. And just to pick up on that, in, in low-income countries, uh, I think the challenge there, since it is going to be external finance related, is convincing capitals that this is donor capitals, that this is the way that money should be channeled in the future. And so if we agree or, or believe that the future funding coming from donors, at least, is at best flat, maybe some increases at the margins here or there, maybe some decreases, um, if more funding is going to a different uh, channel, um, or different area of health, different focus, it's going to come from something already. So that's, that's, that is the, the risk um, that I was alluding to earlier. So it's not that the, it's clear from the data um, that health system strengthening, that basic infrastructure has not been a focus. It's certainly gotten um, funding and, and bolstering through some of the health areas itself, and it's hard to sort of paint that picture, but it's not been a focus. And to the extent that it becomes more of a focus, which it, it obviously needs to, to be strengthened, um, it can come at the risk of some of the other things. Well, and you're very familiar with the U.S. context um, and how yeah. those decisions are made on Capitol yes. Hill. Have any predictions on how you see this playing out? Um, I think the, the challenge in the U.S. context is that 
it seems that there's a real weariness on the Hill for, I mean, global health has, has, has enjoyed tremendous bipartisan um, support and attention in very difficult times. And, and that, we're still seeing that this year, but I, I, you're starting to hear more weariness, I think, around the edges of, you know, how much do we need every year? It's global health, global health, global health. And it's gotten, there's, I think among some, there's an, a sense of global health has really gotten a lot. And, um, and it's true, it's not, it's not met a gap, there's still a gap. So that is one um, discussion or occurrence, the undercurrent that is, is on the Hill. And then I think um, while there's been a really good effort to raise awareness about what health infrastructure means and what it has, why you have to bolster it to have successes in child health and have successes in family planning, have successes in HIV, it's much harder to translate that, in, at least in the US uh, uh, congressional sense, translate that into a line item on a budget or a bill, as you know. And so I think that's really a challenge just in the basic structures of how our, our, our Congress works and how things are funded. So it's, it's an uphill battle, I would say. I think there's more of a recognition today of why that's important, but no, no closer to a solution of how to do it. Right, I, I, I would add there's competition for dollars. So just as there may be a wariness about global uh, health investment, now there's increasing concern about uh, uh, investment in biomedical research in the United States. So it, it, it's clear that the U.S. used to uh, spend about 54% of the world's investment in biomedical research, about 50 or 54%. Now it's about 40 or 45%. That's of tremendous concern to other parties on Capitol Hill. So there are competition for these limited dollars. The pool of resources isn't going to get much larger, and so there may be shifting. And, so the attention may shift away from global health into biomedical research investment in the U.S. So uh, on the opposite of the doom and gloom side, uh, there, there, is one, there is a big pot of money that exists for which it may be increasingly possible to make the case that health should have a larger share, not smaller, and that's IDA. So if you think the bank's uh, mechanism around IDA, a lot of the money flowing in is payments of old IDA loans. And so even if the donors aren't replenishing at the same rate, there's still a lot of money in IDA. And traditionally, uh, IDA has gone uh, quite a lot to infrastructure, but you now have other actors on the infrastructure front, like the new bank in, in Asia. Uh, and so it, you know, there is this question in market, what, what is, as countries graduate out of IDA, you still have a big pot of IDA money, what does it go for? And the, you know, the, the case is there to be made, and I know people are trying to, that education and health should be prominent in that. I mean, that's not next year, but that's something that I think can grow on in, in the time frame. And the other, you know, th there's a short-term discussion that we tend to focus on in, in this sort of venue, which is what's going to happen next year or the year after. And then if you go out five or ten years, you might actually have a very different situation if there's continued economic growth in a number of places that are currently development assistance recipients. They may not need very much development assistance. And if donors even flatline at their current level, that pool may be able to go farther for the remaining low-income countries. Uh, so there are, I think it's a different story if you're asking what 10 years out looks versus you know, the next five years. Chris, if you had looked at the investment, for example, in Pakistan or India in 1990 versus 2015, would it have shifted very dramatically over that 15-year period? In I think in countries? dollar terms, it would, DAH has never been a big issue. In For India or Pakistan? Yeah. Okay. Just in terms of the percent, because they're such large populations. Can I add something? Yeah, absolutely. Is, um, Chris was talking about the, what might happen in the next five plus years, which I think is really critical and something we should all, in addition to how the money is being used and should it be used better, is this issue of countries graduating. Yeah. Um, and that's going to happen. I think every, every donor um, should or is looking at that, what does that mean? And it's going to be so critical to get that right and to work with those countries um, and to work with donors to work across e with each other to do it responsibly. Because if that is the case and, and several country, if a country, for example, is going to graduate in terms of eligibility for assistance from more than one donor mechanism at a time, that could have a real lopsided effect on their health span and they're spent on other areas that need attention. So it's gonna be really critical in the next five plus years to get that right and to really make an effort to manage that transition as carefully, as slowly, 
um, and co in a coordinated way as, as possible so that at the end you do get a situation where there's additional funds that could be used where they're still needed versus a situation where there's been um, uh, resurgence of, of challenges because it wasn't handled in, in the best way possible. Well, and that gets at the piece that you didn't go over in your presentation, but domestic spending for health. Um, you know, those numbers, those trend lines seem to be going up in a pretty promising way, but I think there is still a lot of concern about graduation and whether or not countries are going to be able to support the health advances that have been made with the help of assistance. Um, so maybe you could talk a little bit about that piece of, of the data that you didn't get a chance to talk about earlier. Sure. I mean, as you say, I mean, the main, the main reflection there is that spend, domestic spend is growing. Uh, there's less of a relationship than I think we thought in the past uh, of sort of that the share of GDP inexorably goes up uh, as income goes up. That's, that relationship is weakened, and part of it's the DAH part that's sort of broken that. But certainly, the share of GDP doesn't go down. It probably drifts up over time uh, and, and may even go up as income goes up as a driver. And so we're seeing that play out, that you know, as long as the economy is growing, we're seeing further spend. Just a, a quick reflection on the graduation issue. I think the, you know, the bottom line there is cliff models are high risk, right? You get all this money, and then tomorrow suddenly you fall off the cliff. And there's, there's obviously, and there's lots of discussion now about alternatives to cliff models about, that make that, you know, a softer landing than, than uh, abrupt changes in flows. Um, so not to, not to stay on kind of the doom and gloom side of things, but uh, UNICEF released a report today called Progress for Children uh, that notes that millions of children are being left behind despite progress towards the MDG goals. And that if trend lines continue and accounting for population growth, 68 million children will die from mostly preventable causes by 2030. Um, they note that in the effort to reach the MDGs, folks may have focused on the easy to reach children and left behind the harder to reach and the more vulnerable populations. And that when you look at data that, that goes across nations or across continents or across regions, that it can mask the underlying problems with those last 20% or the, you know, the last groups that aren't being reached. So I'm interested in, in, in your reflections on the limitations of the data or how the data can be parsed down to make sure that policymakers are seeing who we're missing even when we're looking across aggregate numbers. You know, <clears throat> I think the, uh, on the epidemiological side, child mortality, malaria, uh, there's been big progress lately of producing super fine grained analyses. So something like the Malaria Atlas Project has now produced a time series by five kilometer by five kilometer you know, pixels of malaria. And that shows you progress in some places and other places where there's not progress. Same thing now is, is starting to be produced for child mortality, super fine uh, assessments of where child deaths occur. And I think eventually we're gonna wanna know where money goes within countries. Uh, to get at this question, because if you could line up the sort of outcome side, which I, you know, you can see a few years into the future, we're going to have available that sort of mapped result for lots of outcomes. And if, if you could track financial flows, then you would start to get at what UNICEF's talking about, which who's actually being left out, and, and where, where are you, where are dollars really not making progress, or the dollars just aren't going? That requires a total change in the way the financial flows are recorded, right? So in the health side, on the mapping side of the data, it's just sort of getting access and geotagging data, but it doesn't even exist in the way most financial books are kept. So even a donor who's interested in this doesn't actually able to say how much goes to sort of remote rural areas of their resources and how much does not. Doesn't mean it's impossible, but I think that's the frame shift that you need to be able to sort of say, you know, the national tracking, it's fantastic, we can now do this, we can trace it, couldn't do it before, but the next step is to look in at least urban rural or some sort of notion of, you know, the people who most in need, is that where the money's actually going? And is that next for you, is that your? Well, I think, you know, we, we can't do it unless the, the people who are, are putting the resources in decide that they want to, track where there was, where, you know, geographically where resources go. It's not sort of like, you know, if you 
put a little extra effort late at night and <laughs> came up with a way. Uh, it, you, it's sort of a fundamental change in saying this is important, we really care about inequalities within countries and therefore we should care where the money goes and let's start trying to track those, that, that information. You know, here I'm more optimistic that science will help. So here, big data, you know, that term big data may actually help. Uh, you know, the world's populated with cell phones. You know, you will be able to record deaths in very small areas. You'll then have to map the resources to those areas, and you'll have to know cause of death. But if you're talking about under five mortality versus morbidity, which are very different discussions, I think big data and science can help hone the discussion about very focused areas, geographic areas where intensive services are necessary. Also, I think you know the data better than I, uh, under five mortality is focused in a very limited number of countries. You're not talking about a large number of countries. So the focus could be either honed even further to focus in geographic areas in specific countries. And I, I do think technology and big data may be able to help frame at least part of the discussion. Great, well, I'm gonna um, open it up to the audience for questions now. Um, we will take probably three questions at a time bundle them all together and then turn it over to the panel. Um, I've got a couple folks uh, who are gonna have microphones in a second in the back. When a microphone Chris. comes to you, oh, if you could sorry. say your name, where you're from, uh, into the microphone for the purposes of the webcast and uh, keep your question relatively short, that would be great. And let's start with this gentleman right here with his hand up straight up for me. Thank you very much, fascinating uh, presentations. Uh, my name is Carl Henn from the American International Health Alliance here in Washington. Um, a couple things that were surprising. I didn't see a category for what used to be an important area of development assistance, which was family planning and reproductive health. Wondering what happened there. Um, also didn't see nutrition and was wondering if that was incorporated under maternal and child health or something else. And the third question was uh, spending in emergencies. Um, I just saw a report that we have the largest number of refugees in something like two decades, 60 million people. And is emergency uh, spending broken down by um, health as well? All right, there's two hands in the back row in the center, and then we'll come back up. Hi, I'm Jacques van der Gaar, Brookings Institution. Uh, I'm happy to join the panel by congratulating Chris and his team for this report. It has become the standard to, to that we all have to live with, I guess. Um, my question is a little different. About two or three years ago, in the same report, there was some analytical work in an annex that, if I remember correctly, showed that, or estimated, that for every dollar that gets into, every development dollar for health that gets into a particular country, the country substitutes about 50 cents of its own resources. I had hoped that that report, which I believe is very true, would have uh, resulted in a, a very lively discussion on how we can do things smarter, because before we start, we seem to lose about you know, $18 billion on, of the 36 that we pump in there. What happened to that report? Is there new information? Are there smarter ideas on how to pump that money into the countries? And then if you want to hand the microphone right next to you. <coughs> Hi, Evelyn Chereau, Global Partners United. Two weeks ago, the United Nations had their annual conference of state parties on the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. And that treaty uh, has been human rights focused in recent years uh, after promulgation. But at this year's meeting, the most critical piece was healthcare access and that leads to education access. 90% of children are not included in schools and their health and rehab access is non-existent. So I'm not surprised to hear about the UNICEF report that came out today. So in that context, last year and this year, the big emphasis from the 154 countries who are ratifying for the treaty is on gathering disability statistics, which hasn't seemed to happen at all in the maternal, newborn, and child health context. If you speak to any of the large 
programs in that area, there are hardly any that have tried to gather anything that has evolved from saving children's lives. So the World Health Organization, the World Bank, estimate one billion people with disability, and we know that that figure is growing due to the aging of the world's population and the life-saving efforts at birth that we know in developed countries has led to increased disability. The auti autism epidemic is one of those. So I'm hoping that when you look at your next report, you might consider, and those who are developing the indicators are considering, how will we have disability counted? It's in a few of the indicators, but it is not in the health indicator. Thank you. All right, great. So we'll turn back to the panel with those. Um, I guess, Chris, starting with you, there were a number of questions there that, that got at categories of data. You know, where's family planning? Where's nutrition? Are there statistics on disabilities? Um, and numbers about spending in emergencies, and I would, you know, both humanitarian emergencies, but also, you know, we have uh, conflicts in you know, parts of the world that are disrupting in major ways, you know, health systems in Syria and Yemen and Ukraine, you know, kind of how is that data integrated into, into what you're seeing? Um, and then also the question about what happened on the diversion of domestic resources in light of development assistance. So on the, on the sort of categorical definition, I'm gonna ask Joe to stand up and answer those <laughs> and shout, Joe. Okay, well, no, can we get a microphone up for Joe? Here, Emily's right here. All right. Thanks. Uh, so regarding the categorical definitions, in the report we do break out child health and maternal health a little bit more granularly, and I think just for space it didn't make it into the, the JAMA article. So if you are interested in family planning estimates, uh, those are not currently on the, the, the interactive visualization, but they are in the back of the appendices, tables, and in, in the actual report. So that, that includes family planning and also um, nutrition, which falls within our child health bucket. Um, and then questions regarding disability. Uh, currently, as far as is, is the development assistance for health, that's not uh, something we're currently capturing. And I think the limitations on how we break out these health focus areas are the data that we utilize as our inputs. And in some cases, funding for HIV is, is, is very well coded, very pr pretty clear on, on how those resources are being spent. Some of the other categories where there is likely less resources going to, the coding is, is uh, is, is also uh, harder to kind of pick out and grab those pieces. So that's not something we've currently broken out. So, so uh, on the other, on substitution. So uh, great question. And the paper you're, you're referring to was actually, uh, there was a, a paper in the Lancet just on the, on the results about substitution. And it's been interesting because, uh, you know, there, it's this sort of classic thing. There's two camps. One camp, the sort of development economists who think substitution is great because it empowers ministries of finance to do what they want to do. Uh, and then there's the health-focused people that say substitution is really bad. And uh, because, you know, the donors and people are putting their money where they, they want it to go, and that's what they would like to have marginal impact with that. So there's, you know, it's not as if everybody thinks it's a bad thing. So that's part of the landscape. And on the other hand, where there are sort of commitments to not have, you know, to have additionality, uh, it's been difficult politically, I think, to say we're going to sort of enforce that or, or even how to track it. So there hasn't been a lot of um, traction to actually deal with this issue head on. And, you know, I think there's also probably, the more we look at this, uh, there's pretty different behaviors out there. In some cases, uh, where resource levels are now so low, there's not a lot of scope for squeezing the sort of government, you know, uh, funding of their own, you know, what we call GHES, sort of government as source funding. You really can't squeeze it much smaller. So you've run up the point where it's no longer much of an issue, whereas in a bunch of other places it is. The other thing that's, that is likely true is there's an asymmetry, unfortunately, which is money comes in, there's a little bit of moving money by the Ministry of Finance somewhere else. When the donor resources reduce, 
they don't give the money back. And so there's also that asymmetry there, which could actually create all sorts of things as we think through the future of less development assistance in some settings. Just last reflection on, on disability uh, statistics. Uh, you know, there's a wealth of resource to be used, which I think is being underused in the quantification of congenital anomalies, of disabilities related to neonatal disorders, disabilities following meningitis, uh, disabilities following cerebral malaria, et cetera. And it's all sitting there in the details around the global burden of disease, where June 8th, I think the Lancet put out the, our results for disease incidence and prevalence uh, in enormous detail. And I think there's a tremendous resource to be used. It hasn't perhaps been aggregated up in the way that the disability community uh, thinks, but there's a lot of descriptive epi there that could be leveraged. I was going to make a comment about the um, question around emergency assistance and cri um, crises, et cetera. I think it's a really good point because in this analysis and really all analyses that we all do of uh, development assistance um, for health, it's not included. And, and that's not because of um, we don't understand that it's, in, it's, of course, important and you can't separate out what happens in a conflict or what happens in an emergency, whether it's natural or, or a war, et cetera, from health. I mean, that's literally the definition of, of health being impacted in those situations. Historically, and, and I, I don't really see this changing, um, the way that institutions approach those, that issue, uh, conflicts and, and crises, is in a fundamentally different way different line items of budgets, different organizational approaches, different authorities to allow things to happen. And those two, don't, those two worlds don't meet very easily. Um, for those who are interested in we put out a report last year looking at this question from a US perspective, particularly saying, these two worlds don't meet. Maybe they should. And what are some ideas for, for trying to bring them closer together? Um, I don't, it's, it's a conversation that happens, but I think it's really hard to impact. So, they're not in the data, but that's just because they, that's just not how the world right now is organized to approach health. Well, it cuts both ways, right? Because in addition to emergency funding coming right. from different sources and being ramped up in emergencies, right. you also have disruption of so underlying health programs. So yeah. you may have health programs moving out and emergency funding coming in. And if the data isn't tracking them, then it gets a very right. confused picture of what's actually going on on the ground. I mean, the sad comment is that Tom Frieden from the Centers for Disease Control has been asking for additional dollars to set up sentinel centers in, uh, around the world to understand when epidemics are developing. He never received those funds, and following the Ebola crisis and epidemic, he has now received those funds. So it, it, it's, uh, it's a sad comment, because I think if Tom were here, he would have said, had there been an investment in uh, over a, a five or 10 year period to develop these local sentinel labs that could do appropriate testing quickly um, that the Ebola uh, epidemic may never had, uh, may never have increased so dramatically uh, as, it, as it did. So now he's received the funding and we'll see if uh, over the next four or five years if it's helpful. Very good point. More questions? Uh, well. Let's come up to the front and just do the three in this row here, and then we'll cluster sample. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, David Bryden with results. Yeah, just real quickly uh, on uh, the trend that Jen was talking about, it is really concerning uh, that we're seeing a flatlining because I think sometimes the assumption is, well, these things don't really affect us. And, and, or the assumption may be that the phenomenon that we're addressing, the global health problems, are not changing, but they are changing because of drug resistance. To just give one example, if you look at drug-resistant tuberculosis, something actually even more dangerous for us than Ebola in, in many ways. Um, and I think actually when you do your next report, you should, you'll have access to, to some actually even more recent data uh, given the fact that some of the most populous countries, it's only in the last two years that we're finally getting access to data that actually show the real burden of disease, of TB, in those most populous countries. Uh, so that, I think, will actually change the statistics rather dramatically. But the question I had is um, child mortality. There's no indicator for child mortality in the, dis in the negotiations going on in the SDGs. This seems kind of crazy. Uh, can, can anyone on the panel uh, enlighten us on this? 
Francisco down the row. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Anthony Dottin from Handicap International. Normally I'm the one asking the disability question, so it was great for Evie to have brought that up. So I'm going to ask a more general question. The, the data was uh, fascinating to look at, and as I saw the different streams of uh, sources uh, of funding, it struck me whether there's anything in the report, any analysis, or there's a data available about how complementary they are to one another. Are we duplicating? I know we touched a little bit on how well is that 36 billion being used, but it sort of struck me, does, does the right hand do, coordinate with the left hand, or are we sort of really stuck in a cycle of even sort of risking um, offsetting one effort against another effort. And on that note, is, is the data there to, to look into where universal health coverage defines different types of health approaches, how much goes into preventative versus curative approaches and so on? Um, thank you. Jerome uh, with UNAID, and I also had a similar question about efficiencies in terms of how the entire financing architecture weaves together given the complexity um, of the funding streams. I also wanted to uh, solicit your comment on um, end user uh, efficiency, specifically corruption and um, exactly what this money is doing. I mean, you might not have gone that far in your analysis, but do you think that this has the potential, or looking at these factors might have the potential of um, either freeing up more resources for global health or you know, in the face of competing priorities, even if the budget or the funding remains static, could there be potential there for um, complementary funding? Thank you. Okay, thank you. So back to you. I mean, I think the, a number of these questions touched on the, now that you have the channels in your analysis, that seems to open up a lot of opportunities for discussion on some of these questions, coordination, complementarity, um, efficiencies, whether or not you know, the corruption issue you might be able to get at eventually. Um, interesting to, to think about kind of what the, the channel allows you to do on these points. And then also the question about kind of where is that child mortality indicator and what happened to it? Goodness. <coughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> I'll start and let's let uh, Howard and Jen try to sum some of those. Uh, on the coordination front, oh, well, something, let's start with a simple one, corruption. We haven't done anything in our analysis on corruption, and I'm not sure we would be able, with the types of data that exist, I don't think we're in a position to, to track that. I think that to, needs some other type of sort of auditing type function to get at that. Uh, the general issue around efficiency, I think, is the, a, a huge issue, and it, it's most it's come to prominence in the area of ART programs, but likely true in, in other program areas that, you know, there's now a, a wide array of studies out trying to quantify the variability in costs per, you know, year of effective ART delivered. It's showing huge variation, you know, probably tenfold variation across programs. So that suggests there's a huge opportunity to learn from, from programs that are more efficient. And as a more general reflection in work that uh, we've done, so I know it sort of personally or directly, but others have done as well, there's probably still considerably, I mean, the, the level of technical efficiency in most facilities in low-income countries is still pretty low, even benchmarking against within each country. So forget about international benchmarking, just within. And that does also suggest there are these opportunities to you know, get more health for the available resources uh, in addition to the continued uh, struggle to maintain the resources that are there. So uh, I think that's a big topic. It'll come more and more prominent over time. Uh, just a, a comment about drug resistance. You know, I think this is, uh, particularly uh, lately, there's been a lot of interest in antimicrobial resistance. And I think there's been a lot of prominent discussion uh, UK government example, and so I think that's, there's some optimism there that there'll be some new resources around antimicrobial resistance, not, not enormous, but still some. So I, I think in the next few years there'll be something in, in, that, in that space that'll, both on the surveillance side and maybe the understandings uh, about it. Um, for the child mortality, there's probably other people, maybe Mark can tell us the, the inside story uh, on how on earth we ended up without child mortality as an indicator. Uh, but uh, my world's a little different than 
the world of my two colleagues. Um, I don't focus just on global health. JAMA is a general medical journal. Um, so I, would, I, I was struck by your, your question about corruption. I thought it was going to be a somewhat different question. We didn't publish a paper about the effect of violence on the delivery of health systems and, uh, and vaccination programs. Um, without going into the details, it would have been a very controversial paper, and we ended up not publishing it. Um, uh, we also have received a number of opinion pieces on corruption and global health dollars and just felt that we didn't have the expertise, nor could we find the expertise to review them. It was, it's a very difficult area and a sensitive issue because you name countries. That becomes problematic. Most, most times people don't want to ever name specific countries, so it becomes uh, more, more difficult. The issue about drug resistance has come and gone from the medical literature. You know, it was very prominent in the medical literature to the mid-90s, late 90s, since my early research was in antibiotic resistance. Uh, and then it disappeared, but it's, um, it's emerged again just in the last three to five years. And both uh, federal agencies, governments, and major foundations have really begun to reemphasize it. The Pew Foundation, interestingly enough, has put a huge amount of resources into trying to understand antibiotic resistance. And I think they're acutely aware of it in the United States, but they're also acutely aware of the concerns about tuberculosis. Uh, particularly in countries that represented the old Soviet Union and um, some countries in Southeast Asia. So I'm encouraged that the solution there may come from uh, the more traditional medical uh, uh, groups that are interested in it or the countries that are more traditionally interested in it because it's going to affect them directly. It will be a threat to the health of people living in the United States and in other countries that are uh, resource rich. So the science may progress to help in, in that particular area. Yeah, I was going to make a comment on corruption because um, it, it clearly is something that comes up all the time when you're doing global health and development work. It comes up on the Hill. It comes up um, with the constituents. It comes up in the, the sort of media. Um, we do polling of the American public, and we ask questions about you know, what the public thinks in terms of the levels of corruption in, in uh, the US dollars spent on global health. And, it's a huge percentage that people think is, is being lost to corruption. Um, and when you stop to go, well, what's the reality? Nobody actually knows the answer. I think those of us who work in global health think it's not what the public thinks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it, it, there is some corruption. That's the price of doing business in every program, every program that's publicly funded and probably privately funded. But what it is is very hard to, to measure. Um, it needs to be measured. We were so interested in this question, we pulled together res uh, researchers and experts who look at corruption in health and development to talk about it. And we put out a report, a summary of that discussion. And it was a really interesting um, uh, discussion to talk about how you can get at it, what the auditing fun function could be, other ways to look at it. It's not that easy um, to measure. It clearly has to be measured. Um, and so if that, if that is of interest, there is some, some information and growing interest in this question. I would just add, you know, global health doesn't live in the isolation of other trends in the, in the United States and, and what influences both citizens and politicians, all of us. So, for example, we spend 2.7, 2.8, 2.9 trillion dollars on health. It's 18, 17, 18, 19 percent of the gross domestic product. You've heard the numbers. They're relentless. Um, the suggestion is that anywhere between 7 or 8 or 10 and 20 percent of that is wasted dollars and whether or not you could refocus those on high value care. Those same issues now are going to emerge in global health and the spend of the $35 billion. And I would argue that the global health community cannot avoid that, that, that discussion because it's occurring in every donor country. And because it's occurring in every donor country, it is going to eventually affect the flow of dollars where people are going to begin to say, tell me if you're spending those dollars wisely. I just can't imagine that that discussion won't emerge over the next five or seven years. And if you think, that the 30 or $35 billion is flat and not going to increase dramatically, then you would really like to understand the efficiency of the way those dollars are being spent so that they could be spent more wisely or shifted to areas of higher yield. So the same discussions that are occurring in the United States and around the world around efficiency will come to the global health community dollars. I think uh, an important uh, follow-up to what I was saying that, that you just alluded to is important here. People use the term corruption. It's really much more compl complex than that. You can have to unpack it. Some of it is just maybe Efficiency, not spending right. things in the right ways, right places. Um, maybe you know not understanding where how to target uh, target money. 
um, you know, not having the systems to get the, the products out to the, to the field that are needed at the right time. That's not corruption. People use corruption to, 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 to capture a whole range of things. So it's really unpacking that, that term and understanding where it's about efficiencies and learning how to do business better versus literally corruption, which is taking money that's, that's supposed to be used for health and using it in, in, in the wrong purpose, you know, just flat out using it incorrectly. That's a much smaller share of what we're talking about. But it is something that stops Congress, for it sure. Does. I mean, you, yeah. um, you know, when you look yeah. at needing to support systems or needing to support countries themselves, there's a lot of hesitance in our government to do that because no one trusts that the money's going in the right direction. So finding a way to put a number on that and measure it would be, right. could be really impactful. Um, I've got a handful right here. And then I promise we'll come over to the side of the room. Thank you very much. My name is Michael Azefo. I have looked at the figure seven, which presents uh, these flows from multi sources. And the question that comes to mind is well, you, you take the US, France, Germany, Britain, and so on. Their priorities are not always the same. Uh, their perception of the healthcare system are not always the same. And then you think of the receiving countries, they also have priorities which are not necessarily the same. I think uh, some further work is needed to look at what happens and how can we improve uh, the way that multi-donor funding gets to the countries and how it is used. Even when it comes from a UN agency, the UN agencies all employ people who come with knowledge of the healthcare systems in their own countries. And therefore, they push agendas that are not necessarily in consonance with the, first of all, the problems of the countries and the needs of the countries. I, one area I can cite very clearly is uh, over the last 50 years, we have neglected the question of health personnel, training, deployment, and maintenance. And this is why a lot of the funds that have gone in have really not provided indicators that the MDGs or anybody can start up and say, this is great. And these global statements become more wishful thinking uh, than empirical evidence we can quantify and say we've made progress here. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. If you could hand the microphone in front of you. Yep. Hi, uh, Jason Saridar from USAID. Uh, I just want to thank all of you. And um, my question kind of pertains to the same figure seven and the permutations that were brought up in the slides. Um, one of the things I noticed going through that was that with the exception of Great Britain, there is very little investment in health systems support and health system strengthening. Um, I just kind of wanted to see if you guys had any ideas as to why that might be, given that um, between health systems and NCDs, those are two of the big things we need to figure into our collective agenda going forward. So is the lack of health systems focus kind of based on the verticalization of donors? Is that uh, poor m and &E, is that uh, perceptions of corruption, what kind of um, attributes to that? Yep. And right in front of you. I'm Heidi Ross with Malaria No More, and my question actually tags on what Jason was saying, and that is that I'd like to hear a little bit more how you categorize the health system strengthening money, because I think a lot of us would argue that various pro programs do support health system strengthening. Malaria, PMI, trains health work, community health workers. We know that the impact of Ebola was lessened in Nigeria because of the strong health systems that were put in place as part of PEPFAR and as part of Gavi. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about the health system strengthening and how that was done in this report. And then on top of that, hear a little bit more about how we can get better data surrounding health system stre strengthening, because I think that it gets a bad rap on Capitol Hill because we don't have a lot of tangible things that we can point to, and that health system strengthening is going to be a key component of the future of global health. And so how do we tell that story better? Great. Thanks, Heidi. So a couple of different questions there on health systems, kind of what does it mean? How do we sell it? How do we get the data? Um, I would add to that kind of in addition to the bilateral programs that support health systems, what about the multilaterals, you know, Gavi, Global Fund? 
Um, and then also the question about differing priorities, uh, which I think gets towards country-driven processes, which is one of the goals of the, of the uh, sustainable development goals, that these be country-led uh, priorities, but is that, how is that gonna play out? So on the health systems front, uh, I, first on the definitions, the, what gets labeled as health systems are projects where that's the primary focus, primary stated aim. So uh, it's certainly possible and likely that investments and other things can have spillover effects on health systems, and, but those aren't captured in that bundle. Uh, to the question of why there's less investment uh, in health systems, I mean, so, you know, there's a lot of rhetoric about health systems. There always has been. This is not a new topic. I mean, you go back 20 years, there was always the same discussion that, you know, that this is a, a weak point. So there, there is actually resistance uh, to investing in health systems, despite what anybody may say, because the, the, di the policy discussion is always the same, and there hasn't been a big shift in the dollars. And I think part of that is about accountability. It's harder for donors to report back to their legislatures and with clear metrics of, around accountability to say your dollars or our dollars did X and led to Y. And that's just been a harder thing to do. And then there's been waves in the health systems world, as I'm sure you know, of people being more or less pessimistic about whether the investments that have been made have done much. Uh, you know, there was a pretty well, you know, famous internal review at the World Bank in the late 90s that basically said, look, if you compared the vertical investments to the health system ones, the vertical ones just did a lot better. And so that, you know, there is also this sort of undercurrent that it's harder to know if you've got the right investment strategy, so it's more, more difficult to show accountability, and it's a little bit of a, a sort of poor uh, sort of value proposition in many regards. Doesn't mean that all apply to that, and that's sort of a little bit of a, a victim of the way things were done in the past or what types of investments were made. On the metric side, I actually Chris, think- Chris, just a, yeah. a comment. I, I am, uh, that last point, um, uh, as a physician, a pediatrician, certainly I agree that everyone should should have access and should have universal health care. But one should not imagine that the, the relationship between universal health care and non-communicable diseases is very strong. Um, and there's many countries that have universal health care that are really struggling with non-communicable diseases. And so sometimes people equate an investment or um, universal health care with the, the ability to reduce non-communicable diseases. I would say that relationship from an evidence base is tenuous. And um, I would argue we should have universal health care, but we should not link it necessarily to then having an impact on non-communicable diseases. One could have a substantial impact on non-communicable diseases without universal health care. And, and, you know, so now, back in 2000, we published, it when, when I was at, with colleagues at WHO, the World Health Report 2000 about performance evaluation of health systems. Some of you may remember that. And uh, we ranked the world's health systems and we had some outcome metrics. Uh, back then the data wasn't like it is today. Uh, and so, you know, lots of uncertainty around that. But in the debates that followed that from 2000 to 2003, I think the, the, the thing that emerged to me was that if you really want to track health systems, it's not enough to count you know, uh, infrastructure, you know, headcount of, of human resources or availability of the, the real metric, and it sort of comes to Howard's comment of having a high performance health system is that you are delivering the things to people that they need. And that's the, the notion of intervention coverage with quality embedded, and we called it effective coverage. And then that, that construct we put out didn't have much traction at the time. It's sort of come back in the yeah. universal health, uh, you know, universal coverage agenda. So now people start talking about effective coverage. Uh, and, but now what's interesting is it's sort of much more measurable than it was. We have so much better data. The, the methods are so much better that you actually could do a, a reasonably decent job of saying what fraction of things that people need are they getting. And that would encompass the NCDs. The closest that anyone's got to this was in Mexico, where Julio Frank and Rafael Lozano and others tracked this at the state level. Super fascinating. You know, coverage for maternal and child health package, pretty high. Coverage for NCDs, you know, 20% of what people needed, you know, including pretty short list of things that they were tracking. 
So I think that would be the direction of, of having sort of a more serious effort at tracking coverage. And, you know, ideas, uh, interest in that's there because of universal health coverage. How you do that for the NCDs is pretty tricky because the routine dependence that we all have on mix and DHS uh, to tell us about uh, you know, what's happening in a health system from a population perspective is so MCH focused or that it's a little bit hard to stretch into some of these other areas that health systems are central for. But it's doable. Any comments on the, the country-led process no, and, and the it, it, differing priorities perhaps between the, the donors that, that you profiled? And, and no original comments on that, given what's been said. The only reflection on that is that I think transparency about where dollars go, where they're, whether they're government dollars or development partner dollars, is a huge contributor to that because you know, when it's not clear, then it's uh, much harder for you know, a clear set of priorities from a country to emerge. So I actually think that just the task of documenting where monies go, but whether government or donor helps in that regard. So we're running short on time. There were a couple hands that I have been ignoring. Do we still have a couple questions over here? Let's take these two, and then we will wrap up. So right here, Tara. Thank you very much. Erin Emma from the American Academy of Pediatrics. I'll unite two of these strands about non-communicable diseases in maternal and child health with another perplexing thing in the SDGs is that the indicators suggested for non-communicable diseases, 3.4, don't actually address children. And so that raises the larger issue of, do you see in development assistance going forward more integration across siloed approaches, such as NCDs, NMCH, or others, or do you see a continuation of the type of disease-specific or population-specific approaches that we've seen in the past? Thank you. And then let's come up right to the front corner here. Hi, thank you very much. I'm Lily Kark from USAID. Um, I had a question about um, uh, the way you've lumped newborn health and child health together, which actually these days is not very helpful because I think newborn health has become a field in its own right and we really need to track the funding for newborn health. Uh, even though the newborn is a little child, uh, the interventions are quite different. So, uh, so it really doesn't tell the true story. So I quickly went through your document and uh, might have missed it, but I didn't see any breakdown uh, between the two, and I would really love to see that analysis. Otherwise, it's not very helpful for people who are focusing on newborn health. Um, the other one, I just wanted to respond to the issue of the SDG target. I understand the discussions are still going on. I think there's a, a very strong advocacy group trying to get the target in there for child health. Uh, but it is stated as ending prevent. There's no number there, but it is stated as ending preventable child mortality and ending newborn uh, mortality. And uh, a lot of analysis, as you know, has already gone into actually specifying what the target is in order to end it, what should it be. So we do have the two numbers, it's 20 by 2035 for under five mortality, and it's 10 for NMR, for neonatal mortality by 2035. So we do have the targets, but they're not in the SDG uh, document itself, which is, I think, I agree, would be very important to have it there. Thank you. Great, thank you. So the question about integration across silos, which we've talked about a little bit, but maybe we can delve in a little bit more. Um, the question about newborn versus child health. Um, and then I will just add for kind of closing comments, uh, feel free to give whatever closing comments you feel is appropriate, but if you could kind of wave your magic wand and create the next data set that you could analyze, what would it be? Just one? <laughs> yes, let's prioritize. <laughs> Uh, so, so ju just, uh, I'll, should I go first? Uh, the yeah. uh, rapid fire on that. Uh, aspiration or forecast? Aspiration, integration would be good. Forecast, I don't think it's going to happen. So, but hopefully I'll be wrong. Um, the newborn versus child, I think that should be on our to-do list because I think we're, as we, in, in an, another initiative with uh, Ray Chambers and, and uh, uh, UN Special Envoy, we've been looking at a, a live safe scorecard. 
and uh, you know, trying to say the dollars have gone in, how many lives have been saved, and, and sort of can you infer that? And that's, it merges really clearly there, because if, if, when you look at the maternal side, if you don't take into account the connection to newborn, then you, you would get a, a very different picture. So I think that should be on our to-do list. I don't know the technical feasibility uh, in terms of how much project description there is from donors, but it's certainly something that we should look at. Uh, last comment on the child mortality. So the target's there without a number, but the indicator's not, as, as you know. And I think that what I take from the MDGs is having the targets good, but you've got to have the sort of drumbeat of measurement and to keep people accountable. And if you just have a target, the history of targets without indicators has not been great. Um, so, and uh, you know, I'm sure half the room knows the whole politics and, and you know, that at this juncture, it's looking sort of grim that there'll be new indicators. But uh, who knows, maybe the, the Greek debt crisis can be solved. Maybe uh, this, the SDG <laughs> lack of child mortality can be solved. I agree with Chris on the integration question. Um, yes, good, good thing to work toward, probably not gonna happen. Um, and I was just gonna add on the, my, next, my, my wish for the yeah. next data set um, to look at. Uh, one of, so the, the, the fact that you can now look at source to channel to health focus is, is pretty incredible. I would love to be able to see health focus broken down even further. Who is the ultimate recipient? Um, even if you could do it uh, proof of concept for a couple of donors. Um, we've tried to do it for the U.S., others have tried to do it for many. It's really hard to trace that first input down the line to who is the ultimate recipient. Um, and, and that's not unique to any one uh, funder. It's, it's a real challenge. So my, that's my wish list. I'd love to see that really cool graphic going all the way down to people. Uh, well, what would JAMA publish next? It's a little... There <laughs> <laughs> we go. Question for me. Um, I, I think I started by saying, you know, I thought this was part one of what needs to become an increasingly detailed analysis of what's happening with 35 or 40 billion dollars a, a year. So I, I think you, you know, the next focus really needs to try to understand where the dollars are working well and where the dollars aren't working well. And then to generate from that, try to understand why does it work well in one place. And, and not in another place. Because I, I, my, my sense is that um, the golden age of growth in, in the dollars is, is likely uh, uh, to be over. As I, I said, the, the one great unknown is uh, the Buffett money that will go to the Gates Foundation, which is substantial at his death, and how the Gates Foundation will decide to spend those dollars. That will potentially represent a very substantial increase in that $35 billion on a yearly basis. Um, but that aside, I, I don't see donor countries really emerging with, uh, with new funds. Oh, Chris, I'll give you the last word. What's your wish list? Oh, I have too long a wish list. Uh, I would like, uh, in, the, in the financing space, I sort of like Jen, I would like to trace dollars down to the ge geography where they're actually being spent. Because that would address a little bit of you know, how much is going elsewhere along the way. Uh, not corruption, but in terms of overhead and, and other you know, sort of processes. Uh, but if you could actually trace it down to where the spend is, I think you can start to put that together with the increasingly rich sort of stuff that comes out of the, the, the the burden of disease at fine grain level, and you can start to do some really interesting issues that Howard was alluding to, which is, you know, where's it working and, and where's it not? Great. So that's the wish list. Well, many thanks to our panel. Thank you all for coming today, um, and we hope to see you at our next event. Thanks.